welcome to your bedtime story. My name is Betsy and I'm a children's librarian with Frederick County Public Libraries. Tonight we are going to continue looking at some American folklore and legends. Um, as I said last night, we were going to be looking at the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And this is a story that many would um, state fact or fiction, did he, didn't he? So I thought it would be best to start by reading the poem um, that started the whole story. And that is, it's called Paul Revere's Ride by Henry, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And he lived from 1807 to 1882. He was not alive at the time, obviously, when Paul Revere would have ridden um, through Massachusetts, um, but he did research the story, um, and we'll talk about that part at the end. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march, by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light, one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said, good night, and with a muffled oar, silently rode to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, were swinging wide at her moorings lay, the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hawk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend through alley and street wanders and watches with eager ears till the silence around him he hears, the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet and the measured tread of the grenadier marching down to their boats at the shore. Then he climbed to the tower of the church, up the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade by the trembling ladder steep and tall to the highest window in the wall where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead in their night encampment on the hill wrapped in silence so steep so deep and still that he could hear like a sentinel's tread the watchful night wind as it went creeping along from tent to tent and seeming to whisper all is well a moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead for suddenly all his thoughts are bent on the shadowy something far away where the river widens to meet the bay a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side. Now he gazed on the landscape far and near. Then impetuous stamped the earth and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old North Church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles in passing a spark, struck out by a steed that flies fearless and fleet, 
That was all, and yet, through the gloom and the light, the fate of the nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by that steed in his flight, kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic, meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders, the skirt its edge, and now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock, when he crossed the bridge into Medford town, he heard the crowing of the cock, and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of river fog that rises when the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, blank and bare, gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleeding of the flock and the twitter of birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown and one was safe and asleep in his bed who at the bridge would first be to fall who that day would be lying dead pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest in the books you have read how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from each, from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again, under the trees at the turn of the road and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. So that is what Henry Rods Wadsworth Longfellow wrote about him. He, uh, like I said before, he was clearly not alive when um, America claimed independence from the British and the British um, sent troops to the U.S. shores. He did, however, he did study the history. Um, he, there were some works that were prominent of the time. There was a history of the United States. Um, and then he um, had obviously talked to people who had talked to their grandparents and that thing. Um, but he did manipulate some facts. So let's talk a little bit about that. And so for that, we're going to turn to our Hoopla book, um, Early American Legends and Folktales, edited by Joanne Randolph. And again, thank you to Cavendish Square Publishing um, for allowing us to uh, read portions of this to you. And so it says here, did he or didn't he? Paul Revere's ride. By the spring of 1775, the conflict between Great Britain and the citizens of the Massachusetts Bay Colony had grown increasingly tense. Five years earlier, in an effort to punish those resisting their authority, British troops had fired on a crowd in what was called the Boston Massacre. Then in 1773, Colonists had protested the Tea Act with the so-called Boston Tea Party, a dumping of tea into Boston's harbor. The British responded by closing the port. Matters came to a head in 1775 as the British prepared to attack armed colonists. The situation worsened in April of that year. That's when General Thomas Gage, the soldier who commanded the British garrison in Boston, dispatched 1,000 troops to Concord, Massachusetts to seize the colonist weapons. One version of what happened that day in April was made famous 75 years later in 1861 when Henry Wadsworth Longfellow published Paul Revere's Ride in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. The poem immortalized the feats of one particular Bostonian on the eve of the American Revolution. And then she go, I just read it to you, but she does go on to read um, a portion of the poem. 
um, specifically the of the North Church Tower as a signal light, one if by land and two if by sea. In Longfellow's telling, Revere waited on the opposite shore, as we heard talking about the horse and everything. Um, the Paul Revere of Longfellow's poem spread the word to the communities outside of Boston. We talked about that, right? He goes to every Middlesex village at the one o'clock hour, at the two o'clock hour, reaching the towns of Lexington and Concord shortly after midnight. But as it turns out, um, like I said, Longfellow's poem contained a good deal of fiction. Paul Revere was the son of a French immigrant and a prominent Boston silversmith, and he was not a singular hero um, of that particular ride. Paul Revere's ride was a collective effort, um, and his recent biographer, David Hackett Fisher, told us that Revere would be very much surprised by his modern image as the lone rider of the revolution. Not only did many other messengers travel by horse to warn neighboring towns, Revere's actual assignment had been to warn two prominent colonists, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, that the British military was on its way. And then further, after successfully warning both Adams and Hancock, Revere was taken prisoner by the British, but he was able to escape. The battles of Lexington and Concord that followed the ride of the many messengers was the beginning of the American War for Independence. Longfellow may have created the legend of Paul Revere, but the credit for alerting the colonists to the coming of British troops deserves to be shared by the many colonists who risked their lives on that night and on the many that followed. And so, um, why? Um, that's what I always find interesting is that when we can figure out why, why did Longfellow write this myth? And so, um, obviously, so um, part of the reason is the poem was written in 1860. And so America is on the verge of another war, the Civil War. Um, and Paul Re or Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a very staunch abolitionist, which means he was against slavery. He had lots of family members who were also um, prominent abolitionists um, and had come forward and had contributed to a poetry book he wrote in 1842 called Poems on Slavery, although he believes the book made very little impact. Um, so part of the reason was he was, the scholars today believe, is that he was trying to appeal to the Northerners, their sense of urgency, um, and as a call for action. Um, he wanted to use poetry to remind readers of their cultural and moral values, and that he is at the hour of darkness and peril and need that he is actually speaking to is what's going to happen if the Union fractures, which as we know, um, it goes on to happen. And he is correct when he says that hardly a man is now alive. Um, the youngest um, Lexington militia member, a man by the name of Jonathan Harrington, had died in 1854. He was 96 years old. A few years before the poem had been written, he was the last, I guess, quote unquote, survivor of the American Revolution. Um, and so he really wanted to kind of tie both what the country was going through in 1860 and 1861 to what the country went through um, with the American Revolution. And a lot of scholars will argue that his mistakes were deliberate to make the poem work and as a rhyme. Um, so a little bit of the um, historical inaccuracies include um, the poem depicts the lantern signal. Ooh, kicked my camera. <laughs> the lantern signal in the Old North Church as meant for Revere, but actually the signal was from Revere. He is the one who ordered it to be set up. Um, the poem will depict Revere rowing himself across the river, when in reality he was a passenger and was rowed by others. He also did not go to Concord that night. Um, he went, I guess, later or maybe not even at all. Um, the majority of criticism, of course, as we talked about, is that Longfellow gave sole credit to Revere for collective achievements of three other riders, as 
three other writers, as well as numerous other ones, including slaves whose names do not survive to history. Um, it says, in fact, Revere and William Dawes rode via different routes from Boston to Lexington toward John Hancock and Samuel Adams to announce that British soldiers were marching from Boston to Lexington to arrest Hancock and Adams and seize the weapons stored in Concord. Um, Revere and Dawes rode toward Concord where the malicious arsenal was hidden and there they were joined by Samuel Prescott who was a doctor. Um, they were eventually stopped by British troops in the town of Lincoln on their way to Concord. Prescott and Dawes escaped but Revere was detained and questioned and then escorted at gunpoint by three British officers back to Lexington. Of the three riders only Prescott arrived in Concord in time to warn the militia there. And so this is the part I talked about a little bit yesterday is that so many of these poems were presented as historical fact. And it says here, for a long time, historians of the American Revolution, as well as textbook writers, relied almost entirely on Longfellow's poem as historical evidence. Um, so they uh, don't want us to de um, myth the word is demythologize or don't think that he is not important. He most certainly was important, but then they also want to make sure that the individuals who rode with him, of course, anybody whose name did not survive history should well um, be recognized as well. So I thought that was very interesting because again, growing up, that is most certainly something um, that we learned um, even into high school. Um, the idea, one if by land, two if by sea, it sounds like that was uh, certainly true, but it didn't necessarily turn out the way we were taught. Um, just another fascinating fact or fiction from our American Legends um, stories. So tomorrow, we're going to get a little scary, and we're going to talk about some scary legends. So these are very prominent in the Southwest, as the um, United States expanded after the Louisiana Purchase and then after the Mexican-American War. A lot of folk tales and fairy tales came from the Spanish who already lived in the areas of Southern California and Arizona, um, New Mexico, and Texas. And so we, um, those eventually who arrived out there as part of Westford expansion, kind of adopted these stories as a way to warn um, the, what I was, what we were told um, years ago in a, a history class that I took was that the Spanish mothers used the stories to warn the children from playing where they could be kidnapped by encroaching colonizers. And then of course the colonizers picked up these stories, used the same stories to warn their children not to be kidnapped by the residents or the, um, the already indigenous peoples who live there um, so they wouldn't be kidnapped. So it was kind of a twofold situation, but we are going to look at some scary legends out of the Southwest tomorrow night. So I will be here at eight o'clock. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you. Have a wonderful evening. Again, if you are looking for any information on our virtual programs, you can visit fcpl.org. And of course, if you want information on the Summer Challenge, that is www.fcpl.org forward slash summer. Have a wonderful evening and I'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.